I work for cancer patients. There's no easy intro for that, and it's not an easy job. I really do give the worst terrible news you could possibly imagine for folks, but I also give some of the best news to people. One of the great joys I get from doing this job is that bouncing between these two extremes, I'm invited and I can bear witness to some of the most profound time points and events in the human experience. And it's not the toughest job out there. I think, looking back across even history, I think of a school teacher believing in the common human experience, working to teach in the segregated South in the early 1960s. How low were her lows? But then thinking about the other end, the other side of the human experience, how would these smiles impact her? This is an iconic picture of two Mississippi Freedom School students. Freedom Schools. Let that sink in. Freedom Schools were tuition-free, temporary, almost like pop-up schools for African-American children in the Civil Rights era. They were a concerted, purposeful part of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, at the time of their creation, they mostly took place in Mississippi in the summer of 1964. And at that time, for context, Mississippi was one of two states that did not require formal, standardized education for any of its children. Black and white kids had separate curriculum, separate school budgets, and desegregating their schools. I don't need to tell you that story. And despite all that headwind, these schools dared to be awesome. They were standardized, they were meticulous. They exposed kids to STEM before, decades before STEM was cool. They even exposed kids to public health disparities with cold hard numbers that impacted their own communities in the South. Now, these freedom schools lasted for just, in this form, for only one summer, but their influence lives on to this day. The brilliant educators that originated them understood that education is just a, one part of a longer journey to shared universal human dignity. Good schools are able to point students to a good job and a good career, and that's great. But they're able to point to so much more. They're able to point to good housing, to better groceries, to better shopping, public transport, to opportunities for health. And we doctors are finally taking to heart that the health care that we provide is not the same as health. We are prioritizing and scientifically studying the social determinants of health. These are the environmental factors that holistically determine whether a person, you, me, anyone, thrives or succumbs to illness. I see these factors every day in my clinic as a cancer doctor. And I want to convince you of that. And to do that, I'm going to transport you to my clinic via this map of Memphis. For those not lucky enough to live in Memphis, to orient, this is the, the Mississippi River winding southward. On its shores is the downtown central Memphis region and further on the eastern metropolitan suburbs. You'll notice that this map is subdivided, and it's subdivided into census tracts. And those census tracts are color-coded. The deeper, the richer the color, the richer the neighborhood. Now, you'll also notice some circles, and those circles are a terrible punchline. Those circles represent the proportion of my patients in my clinic who are not making it through their treatment on time, because of social obstacles, putting their cure at risk. You'll also notice that the circles are two different colors, representing the two major racial groups of the city, 
black, and white. Both colors, both races are impacted by this. Cancer is colorblind, but you'll notice that those colors don't live next to one another. They're not neighbors. You'll also probably not be surprised that these circles are not there for the same reasons and for the same social obstacles on either, uh, on either side of the color divide. This is a classic snapshot of segregation. In this case of health, and it walks hand in hand with segregation of housing, child poverty, hunger, just about any social ill that you can think of. So to take a step back and to place this into a proper perspective so that we're not blinded by the headlights and we can actually be called to action, how do we break through and disrupt long-standing inequality that impacts our children, our communities, and even our cancer patients. Well, we can't do it with one-off solutions. We have to be thinking about combo shots. We need to be leveraging talent and resources which don't obey the old limits that we have grown accustomed to. And you can ask, what is that? Wrong question. Who is that? I want to introduce you to some people who can cure more than cancer. These are some courageous cancer epidemiologists out in the field investigating root causes for cancer risk in the homeless population here in downtown Memphis. They have scoured the medical literature. They have looked for difficult problems that impact their own neighborhoods. They have conducted a scientific study, they've collected the data, they have presented this data to their peers and to their mentors, and they've just entered middle school. I want to introduce you to the cancer-caring heroes of Project CLIMB. Project CLIMB, cancer learning in my backyard, where some of the smallest scientists can launch the biggest ideas. And so let me set the scene. You're in sixth or in, you're in ninth grade. For me, ninth grade might be up here. <laughs> um, you have been exposed to STEM in your classes, physics, biology, human, uh, human sciences, but never real deal research. And you're given the chance to do real deal research by applying for a cancer grant. Just like a real scientist sticking out her neck, asking and answering new questions. And kid, that cancer grant is yours. You ask the questions, you develop the skill sets, you introduce yourself to adult mentors who will help you find those answers and you put those ideas out into the public square where you can debate and move on to new questions. And perhaps most importantly of all, those answers circle back directly to your own community. Why? Because you've anchored your research in cancer issues and risks that impact your own family, your own neighbors, your own community. And because you are a kid, you ha may have perspectives into quiet, hidden social cancer risks that your adult mentors may never have imagined. And in return, those mentors may point you to a scientific career that you may never have imagined. You, your community, your city's health, your city's healthcare system, all these boats can rise. And this is a blueprint of this. Don't squint. I'm showing this to you to convince you we're sweating the details. We're developing machinery to really get this job done. Any machine, if it's to work, has to depend on a simple, doable design. And ours is as simple and as doable as it gets, and I know it because it's what got a guy like me through medical school. This is the secret sauce in which medical students simmer to become seasoned doctors. See one, do one, teach one, pretty simple. Watch an expert do an impossible task and then do it with your own hands. Lather, rinse, repeat, do it a million times. Then to reinforce you lear your learning, you pass it forward, hopefully as a mentor to another student. No magic wands, just impactful learning. Now, to make this machinery work, you need mechanics. A good scientist is a humble scientist. She knows when to ask for help, and we've asked her help from a remarkable collection of superstars. Now, just to, just to point out a couple of faces, I want to point out 
two folks who are leading this project with me. Michelle Martin from UT Medical School, who works alongside me, Idia Thurston from U University of Memphis. But we're surrounded by other smiling faces. And these faces represent no fewer than four Central Memphis schools with STEM teaching experience, three universities, two community advocacy groups with long-standing histories working with Memphis youth, and one national center dedicated to STEM teaching excellence. We're applying, well, deep in the process of applying for long-term funding from the National Cancer Institute. That's where real grants come from. And we've been blessed with local partnership from the Pyramid Peak Foundation to start a Fundamentals of Science class, which we are going to start this spring, but we're not waiting. I hope you've been asking yourself some obvious questions. Why kids? And can kids really do research like this? And folks, we're building skyscrapers. Our kids need to be standing on floors above our heads, and they're already pretty much there. Remember those young epidemiologists that we're talking about? This is their work. I'm going to show you slides from them. This is unfiltered. This is their uh, statement of work and their original source documentation, which is stuff I would use to write my own grants. This is them out in the field. This is utterly courageous and fearless. Many of these girls took me aside and told me they had never spoken to a, a homeless person before. They didn't even think about how homelessness impacts a person's health, and yet here they are. And this is their data. One of dozens of slides that they showed, looking at things that adult researchers have not given enough attention to, the attitude of the homeless to their own health. And to top it off, they professionally showed, showcased their data at a scientific forum that they held for their peers, their mentors, and for an incredibly humbled cancer doctor. And I remain humbled by how limitless these kids are. And I'm also humbled by how tall the shoulders are that we have to stand on to reach higher, to mend old fractures in a broken world that we share but we are called to climb, to reach higher. We cannot confuse humility with fear, and we are about to be surrounded and guided by many fearless climbers. Memphis, come climb with us. Thank you. <laughs>